Operation Manager at ORE Catapult. And before we begin, I'll say a few words about what MIMRI is and the consortium behind it. MIMRI stands for Multi-Platform Inspection, Maintenance and Repair in Extreme Environments. It grew out of discussions held during an Innovation Lab event back in 2018, and eventually won funding from Innovate UK for a two-year technology innovation project worth more than £4 million. The concept was inspired by the mission planning for chains of robots working together in space. And later you'll hear more from Professor Sarah Bernardini, who has previously planned missions for NASA Mars exploration rovers. The memory vision is a chain of robotic platforms working together to conduct operations and maintenance missions in extreme settings here on Earth. Offshore wind was the focus. However, these technologies have applications for a variety of industrial settings. Please use the link in the chat to view an animated film illustrating the whole memory system and also to read this week's press release on memory's results. And I'd also like to point out the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Please get in as many questions as you can for a discussion session with our panelists um, towards the end of the webinar at about 11.45. Um, feel free to get your questions in as we go through um, so you can keep them on top of your mind. In the meantime, I'll hand over to our first presenter, which is uh, my colleague Hamish McDonald, who will explain the memory scenario and its significance in a bit more detail. So Hamish, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Um, we'll just go through the usual um, Zoom song and dance, just to make sure that my slides are sharing okay. Are you able to confirm, Alex, that that's the case? Yeah, that's coming through, Hamish. Okay. Um, so yeah, th thanks for the introduction, Alex. Um, I'm Hamish McDonald. I'm one of the engineers from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult that worked on, on the MIMRI project. Um, and as part of our responsibilities on the project, we're examining the end users' um, uh, specifications and needs. And so I'm going to be providing a bit of context about the, the overall ambition and motivation um, for carrying out a project such like this. OK, uh, I just want to. Um, provide a bit of context in terms of the scale of offshore wind and how far we've come um, since early beginnings. You can see in the, the top left hand side graph that um, we're still seeing um, turbine sizes get larger and larger, we're still yet to see that plateau. Um, and it's, I think it's really hard to get um, a, a sense of scale, um, normally just by quoting numbers of average rotor diameters. So I, I provided a bit of context on the right hand side too. Um, I'm sure everyone's uh, a little bit uh, saturated with um, Euro's talk, but everything in terms of size does to get, tend to get quoted in terms of um, football pitches. So uh, apologies in advance, but I think it's a, a useful um, image just to see how large these, these wind turbines are. I've, I've listed also in the table on, on the bottom left hand side, um, the next generation um, of uh, wind turbines planned for future offshore wind farms and the the sizes of the blades and the overall swept area are truly staggering. Um, so I've overlaid this this uh, this circle of the, the total swept area um, across Hamden Stadium in Scotland. And even if um, that still sounds a little bit nebulous, um, I've provided, uh, you can see here that the, the cars, just how ginormous each rotation of a blade would be um, around these, these gigantic and, and colossal machines. So we're still seeing um, larger and larger wind turbine sizes. We're expecting to see that uh, uh, plateau at some point, but uh, that's definitely not the case just yet um, as the uh, as technology continues to um, uh, cater for these larger wind turbine sizes and increased uh, energy capture density. We also have ambitious plans in terms of um, worldwide installation capacity for wind farms and the the graph here on the right hand side um, is a most recent uh, uh, overview of, of the, the typical um, installation capacities for each of phases of the wind farms. Um, so you can see um, in, in the second side here, um, we, we do have a, a large um, installation capacity already and that are fully commissioned and, and operational um, of around about 7,700 uh, offshore wind turbines, but there, there are much greater plans and ambitions for offshore winds, and we can see here there's still a number under construction uh, on, on the right hand side, but even more so in terms of those that are 
planned further uh, into the future uh, and that have been uh, granted that consent to, to install a wind farm and um, but are still in those early phases so this amounts to almost 20,000 offshore wind turbines in total um, ac across the globe um, which is a truly staggering amount of assets and if you consider all the different components um, on a wind turbine and particularly the blades that's that's 60,000 um, blades roughly worldwide um, and if you dig a little bit deeper and that these are definitely some um, back of the envelope calculations if you collate that entire blade surface area it would account to um, roughly 4,200 uh, football pitches again going with that analogy uh, there um, which is a, a huge um, uh, surface area in total that um, wind turbine um, owner operators have to um, ensure that the, the structural integrity of all these wind turbines. Um, and as we're seeing, um, these wind farms are being pushed further and further um, from shore into deeper waters, um, where we now see the emergence of floating offshore wind um, to um, allow us to tackle these, the, these um, areas which weren't previously uh, accessible. And going further from shore, we're, we're definitely seeing harsher environments. And that has an impact in terms of uh, the weather windows in which you're able to tra travel out and transit to the wind farm or a wind turbine of interest. So what does this mean overall in terms of um, the, uh, the challenge for operations and maintenance of, of these uh, large scale wind farms and, and, and huge uh, wind turbine machines? Uh, we, we have this uh, already uh, initial um, generation of turbines that have been in the waters for some time now, and they're certainly getting on in age. Um, uh, in fact, Wind Europe quoted earlier this year that 26 gigawatts of projects um, in Europe um, will become older than 20 years over the next five years. So approaching um, the kind of uh, typical uh, end of, of life um, periods. And we also have this next generation turbines, uh, th these, these, these big, um, big machines where, uh, although yeah, we have this in increased uh, energy capture, but uh, the downtime of a single turbine is definitely uh, more impactful in terms of the, the lost energy production um, of that asset um, at a wind farm um, uh, overall. So in order for us to, to maintain the trajectory of a, a low levelized cost of energy, it won't be sustainable to, to carry out um, O&M uh, practices um, that we do conventionally. Uh, certainly, um, condition monitoring and structural health monitoring will have a, a, a big role to play um, in, in terms of understanding the condition of our assets and particularly um, um, uh, other areas of the turbines. Um, but primarily, um, wind turbine um, uh, assessment is, is carried out through in, inspection um, measures um, that, that involve um, transiting out to, to these wind farms. Uh, what is important in terms of uh, the, the subsequent effects from that inspection is being able to determine um, when to intervene in terms of uh, a blade repair. What will be the cost of carrying out a repair um, uh, versus uh, the influence on the support the performance. Um, and with these, these huge um, numbers of assets, it will be increasingly important to um, plan for that uh, particular intervention um, before it exacerbates and becomes a real problem where you're seriously affecting the condition of the turbine and uh, its overall uh, integrity. So um, traditionally, um, wind turbine blades were um, inspected by uh, rope access technicians, but we've seen an increased uptake over the last 10 years um, of, of drones being able to carry these inspections. Um, Originally, um, this was carried out onshore, but that eventually tra transitioned to, to offshore wind farms as well. Um, originally, th this was uh, uh, manual or piloted inspections that were carried out with um, a pilot maneuvering the drone and, uh, and another technician um, utilizing the, the camera data that was, was coming back. Um, and there are some obvious um, advantages from using drones as opposed to, to rope assets ignitions. Um, it's thought that the, the drones can operate in, in higher wind speed um, regimes, um, but in terms of accessing um, the wind farm, you're still uh, restricted by the, those limitations of, of a manned vessel. Um, definitely, um, wind turbine drones can um, inspect the turbine quicker versus a rope access technician. By the time the, the technician uh, accesses uh, the wind turbine transition piece, 
climbs all the way up um, a, a tower, which could be 100 meters, 150 meters, um, uh, and then uh, deploys its, its rope access gear and then travels down the length of the turbine uh, looking for any uh, defects or, or damage instances. Um, there is definitely uh, a reduced uh, health and safety risk from, from having to not having to dangle from a rope where you're carrying out this inspection um, and uh, a number of the drone surface providers do carry out this inspection for, from a vessel, either from a, a crew chancellor vessel um, or a larger service operation vessel. And there are other advantages as well from, from the, the data format um, that is uh, obtained from these drone inspections and the associated metadata as well. There's a lot more you can, you can do with this data uh, as opposed to just a, a PDF file that, um, that can be printed or landed on someone's desk. We've also seen um, over the, uh, the last um, five years or so, the implementation of an autonomy as in, in drone inspections, whereby uh, you don't need to um, uh, pitch the blades or, um, or inch the rotor around to examine a particular uh, blade to accommodate for, for the, the drone pilot. Um, and inching is definitely uh, an apt uh, word there. It definitely takes a long time to manually rotate these blades when they're not uh, in operation. So this means uh, faster ins inspections overall. But um, there's still some limitations uh, carrying out um, uh, inspection using this technique. Um, we're still requires the attendance of two drone technicians uh, to attend the site. And again, you, you're having to uh, uh, allow on those, those limitations um, of the manned vessel for transit out to the wind farm. So there's only set times you can do so or set um, weather windows you can, you can carry this out. Uh, and you're still exposing them um, to this harsh environment. Certainly in terms of um, uh, recent G plus statistics, a number of um, uh, health and safety incidents do still are, are still carried out on the vessel just transiting out to the wind farm in the first place. Um, there's also um, uh, an ambition to include um, maintenance repair capabilities um, through the use of robotics. Um, there is the advantage when you do use robotics inspection that they can perform light repairs while, while they're already there if they have the equipment available to them. And there are also uh, other maintenance tasks such as lightning protection system, assessment or drain haulage uh, cleaning uh, that would be uh, advantageous as well. So overall, there's an ambition um, to expand beyond this initial um, form of, of drone inspection and, and move to a fully integrated unmanned um, inspection maintenance and repair uh, practice whereby um, you only need to send out technicians when you really need to. Uh, so that's an eventual ambition, um, but it's important and a very futuristic ambition, but it's important to examine what we're capable at this stage so we can plan for these, these wind farms of the future that are already um, under consideration right now. So um, I, I, yeah, I believe the, the link to the latest press release and information uh, about um, uh, the project will has been shared, um, but just to give a, a quick overview um, before we hear from my, uh, my colleagues as well who are describing what took place within memory, uh, just to describe the, the robotic vehicles that, and subsystems that were involved. Uh, so we have this autonomous surface vessel um, that would provide a, a first pass assessment of the wind turbine blades where they're still um, rotating. Uh, and that would uh, allow for reduced uh, wind turbine downtime and, and lost energy production. Uh, if deemed necessary, the, the drone would launch, uh, sorry, um, the, a drone would be launched from uh, the autonomous surface vessel and deploy um, a crawling robot onto the wind turbine blade. And that, went, uh, that crawling robot would perform a more scrutinized form of inspection and potentially carry out uh, repair if necessary. And this is all coordinated um, by uh, a mission planning optimization system, um, making sure that all these uh, uh, robotic vehicles are uh, operating harmoniously together. And my colleague, uh, Sarah, will be describing that in detail later on. So in terms of the project, um, yeah, we have a, a large consortium utilizing different um, expertise from both academia um, and other sectors as well. Um, so the whole uh, ambition of the project was to uh, really scrutinize the, the building blocks of the full um, process or scenario uh, and try to see um, in terms of the storyboard how far we could get to. Um, certainly the, there are barriers um, to, to full uh, in integration and we'd be examining those as well, try to see what, what would be possible with today's technology. Um, we'd also consider 
uh, in detail um, what would be important for the end user who would be utilizing a robotic system as well and, and taking those commercial considerations uh, into account um, when um, designing um, these, these prototypes which were um, uh, taken from the original concept. So it was a very ambitious um, two-year development program and obviously um, uh, uh, COVID has uh, played a, a large role in terms of um, where we've been able to get to in terms of the project, um, but we'll see uh, later on that we've really tried to uh, prioritize in terms of the full storyboard, those really innovative aspects. There could be um, certainly um, some tangential uh, aspects of, of missions that we could look into that um, with more um, uh, readily available technology, we're really trying to push the boundaries um, of what is, is capable um, today. So there are a number of different end use considerations, but with a project like this, the, the word autonomous does get thrown about quite, quite a lot. And I think it's really important to take um, stock of um, what that means for uh, a system such as memory. Um, certainly when you, you talk about autonomous systems, um, there's a trust and confidence level that, that's important. And it's been apparent throughout the project that that's the case for a wide range of um, stakeholders, not just the end user or owner operators um, of, of wind farms. Um, there'll be insurance um, considerations. There'll be the people um, carrying out um, at, at the wind farm itself, um, designers of the wind farms, uh, standards, um, and all sorts of people. So it's really important that um, effective verification validation of these robot robotic technologies is carried out. Um, we, in terms of uh, end user expectations, I, I think it's become apparent that um, fully autonomous operations um, and autonomy is a, is a spectrum, is a scale, um, will be unlikely. Certainly, they can become very highly automated um, to a, a really uh, a high degree, um, but certainly from an end user perspective, it's important to have that human human in the loop from, from a safe setting, from either uh, an onshore um, station or, or from an SOV uh, further off from shore. So keeping that human in the loop for um, approval of, of certain actions is important. And the capability to manual override in, in, in case of um, any situation is a necessity um, from their perspective. There is, uh, as I've mentioned before, that autonomy is a scale and there is there's certainly a, a capability to not have that as, as a, a set um, level uh, across the mission. You can tune that autonomy um, for certain scenarios, such as uh, transit out to a turbine where uh, the contingencies are fairly predictable and you can uh, put a lot of um, onus on the robotic vehicle um, to carry out those operations. But getting closer to the mission tasks, um, you might see a, a number of different approval requests uh, being carried out. Cybersecurity is, is not something that's um, uh, examined in great detail, but something that um, is certainly um, an important aspect uh, for wind farm owner operators in the future. Uh, and as part of the original ambition um, of, of memory, we're looking to uh, see if we could uh, have direct communication uh, with the turbine. But I think in terms of um, uh, having a robust um, and secure wind farm network, I think that will still be uh, are an approval process that's coordinated um, at, from shore. Um, and certainly that the, for the wind farms of the future, we, we might see um, different uh, robotic vehicles carrying out different tasks. We're focused on uh, wind turbine blade maintenance repair here, um, but um, there are other um, vehicles that could be carrying out simultaneous operations. And so having um, an effective uh, global mission planner is really crucial um, for, for this coordination. It would be um, definitely an eventual ambition to integrate all this, this form of um, uh, uh, O&M planning into uh, standardized practices uh, at offshore wind farms. But certainly for the meantime, uh, I think uh, a system such as maybe would need to prove itself in, a, in the typical kind of service arrangements that I carried out. Um, but in terms of um, utilizing the full benefits of a system, that would definitely be um, an ambition of, of the project. Uh, but would involve uh, an overhaul of standard practices and standard methodologies carried out uh, at wind farms today. So we're going to hear from, from um, a number of different presenters later on in the webinar about um, the outcomes of the project. Um, certainly um, um, to, to be um, transparent about the, the way the projects go, the full memory scenario 
it's still a future prospect, but we'll see um, um, throughout the webinar that successful modular demonstrations um, improving the capability of these unmanned operations and coordinating these multiple robotic vehicles through a global mission planner has been uh, has been achieved. And there are definitely uh, subsystems within uh, these robotic vehicles uh, that could be uh, separately exploitable uh, outside of this um, this memory scenario. Uh, we've also identified out the project a number of barriers to this full int integration and the full re realization of the concept, be it practical, um, or sorry, be it technical and the level of technology at this stage, or practical in terms of what regulations um, are underpinning uh, drone operations and also um, uh, surface uh, vessels, uh, unmanned surface vessels. Um, there may also be uh, commercial and societal uh, aspects in terms of trust and making sure that it's cost competitive um, with existing methodologies. That's something that's been um, clear um, from the side of the project in order for it to be um, uh, not just uh, something that could be trialed at, at wind farms, but also to be really part of the standardized price practice. It does need to be cost competitive and that's what it boils down to at the end of the day. Um, and certainly the, the, the original memory scenario can be refined based on the fact that we have um, different technologies at different TRL or technology readiness levels or states, states of advancement at this stage. Uh, prioritizing what the end user wants is, is, is crucial for that and, and uh, adjusting the, 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 this kind of memory uh, storyboard based on that is, is crucial. And I think we'll see um, as part of um, the eventual maybe ambition, uh, a particular roadmap of, of development and exploitation where we can focus on what can be exploitable commercially now, but also um, help and, and further enable um, those technologies which do further um, development and also further validation and verification as well. So that concludes my initial um, intro into the memory project and its overall ambition, and I'll hand back to Alex. Thanks very much, Hamish. Um, if I could ask you to, to stay on your video just for a couple of minutes. So there's a couple sure. of points I want to, to kind of pick up with you uh, yeah, there and absolutely. dive a bit deeper, if that's OK. Um, so towards the start of your presentation, you mentioned um, increasing the amount of kind of condition monitoring and structural health monitoring on assets. Um, could you explain a little bit more as to how that might integrate with the use of robotics and, uh, and how that might work in practice? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, um, in terms of um, blade condition monitoring, I think we're still um, not as mature as we'd like to be. I don't, don't think we have enough data about the condition of the wind turbine that we're able to um, ascertain remotely. Um, th there's obviously certain structural um, uh, uh, considerations in terms of its, its integrity that um, condition monitoring can uh, obtain, but it might not be able to um, uh, ascertain or a prog um, uh, uh, determine uh, in advance how that damage is, is progressing over the course. So I think um, those two different aspect condition monitoring and robotic vehicles are going to be crucial in order to determine when you can effectively uh, know what, what's a good point to intervene in terms of the damage of your wind turbine blade. So that was a very long winded answer and probably not that clear either, but yeah, no, I think that, that makes a lot two of different sense. Um, uh, technologies will, will play a key role. No, that's great. And, you know, obviously memory is looking at a, a broad range of robotic systems working together mm -hmm. um, kind of in harmony. But, you know, I guess in terms of the status quo at the moment, how much use of individual robotic systems are we seeing in the offshore wind sector? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, one of the most obvious ones we talked about um, in, in this presentation is um, drone inspection, but there are other um, avenues or uh, that uh, robotic vehicles are, are utilized today. We see subsea um, uh, remotely operated vehicles are used to ascertain the condition of the wind turbine uh, blaze foundations and substructure, the cables that are involved. Um, and I think we're starting to see an ex expansion in that area in, in terms of uh, unmanned operations as well. We're starting to see unmanned hydrographic survey become a uh, real obvious um, uh, technology that could be used, um, not having to use a larger manned vessel, which is both uh, costly and has uh, higher emissions as well. So uh, those are the two areas that are most exploitable, but we may see um, different um, uh, opportunities, robotic systems outside of those uh, those obvious ones. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're certainly seeing a lot of kind of R&D projects looking at new uh, robotic systems as well. Um, and so you, you touched on how the, the level of autonomy is likely to kind of increase 
moving forwards up until a point where um, I guess trust and things become a factor in terms of limiting the level of autonomy. But does increasing that uh, amount of autonomy within a system pose any additional challenges around testing, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, it's, as mentioned in the presentation, verification and va validation of these technologies is important to building that trust. Um, and what you're able to do um, within testing, um, you'll need to be able to stress test uh, the operational requirements um, of, of, of the robotic vehicles, uh, how long it can uh, stay out, uh, its, its level endurance um, in terms of its battery capacity, um, its operational envelope that it's, it's able to carry things out. So that, that those types of considerations are, are really important too, but hard to do in terms of um, practical testing. You don't want to break these, these very valuable prototypes that you've worked so hard to develop. So we may see um, synthetic testing uh, become a really crucial part of that, um, being able to keep involve that hardware in the loop and see how it makes decisions without necessarily putting that uh, prototype at risk. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And, and one last question before I let you off the hook, Hamish. Um, so, and, and to put you on the spot a little bit, do you think that the commercial models um, within the kind of O&M phase of offshore wind are going to have to change in order to facilitate the uptake of these very collaborative systems of robotics in the future? Um, you know, at the moment, we have individual robotics, like the drones with blade inspection, for example, where it's a fairly simple service, which you know, makes uh, it is commercially quite easy. But as we move forwards to robotics working together, do you think things are going to have to change a little bit? I think so. I think everything seems to be quite siloed right now, which may be um, what the, the end user desires right now. But in terms of actual uh, improving the efficiency of operations, um, I think we're, we're going to have to see more integration with, with planning um, uh, and, and being more um, uh, having a less reactive philosophy in, in terms of that. Um, we may see, uh, in terms of the memory project, we're focused here on wind turbine blade maintenance, but launching from an ASV, we could we could have multiple robotic vehicles carrying out different tasks. So maybe it makes sense to, to have a, a, a larger mothership for, for doing such things, but that, that may be um, an ambition for, for the future. Yeah, and if I guess moving forwards as well when, uh, uh, you know, for example, if blades are being looked at at the same time as um, foundations or something, um, at the moment, those contracts will be awarded separately, but there might need to be a bit more holistic thinking there. Absolutely. That's a good point. Well, Hamish, thank you very much indeed um, for that presentation. And for the audience as well, just to remind you, please do send any questions you've got through for Hamish um, into the Q&A function, um, and we'll uh, address those in the, the panel session at the end. And if any of the viewers would like more information on the future roadmap for robotics and autonomous systems in offshore wind, you can also view a, a new deep dive report published just this week by ORE Catapult in collaboration with Exodus and the Orca Hub. And you should see the link for that in the chat box uh, for your digestion after the event. But now we'll move over to a presentation on the mission planning aspects um, and the software that overarches memory from Sarah Bernardini who is Professor of Art Artificial Intelligence at Royal Holloway, the University of London. So Sarah, welcome and, and over to you. Hi everyone. So let me uh, start by uh, sharing my screen. All right. So hopefully um, you can see my screen now. Um, okay. So. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, uh, again, and my presentation uh, is about uh, mission planning for MIMRI and the human machine uh, interface. And uh, first of all, I will give you um, a bit of an overview about autonomy and share autonomy, uh, as we have uh, uh, interpreted in uh, MIMRI, and then I will uh, be um, going uh, into the details of how we uh, achieve that. Uh, okay, so um, 
um, in the MIMRI project, my uh, focus has been on uh, generating autonomous and intelligent behavior uh, for a team uh, of robotic systems. And autonomy refers to the system's uh, ability to organize uh, its behavior to accomplish high level uh, goals. Uh, in MIMRI, uh, we have uh, shared autonomy, uh, which um, is when um, we have autonomous uh, um, systems, but those systems share their autonomy uh, with humans. And this is a very um, rich space of investigation uh, in which I think three main uh, dimensions uh, matter. Um, whether the robot and the human share uh, the same physical space, uh, then uh, what is the role of the human and uh, if the, um, the robot and the human uh, inhabit the same uh, temporal dimension. And now I will, uh, uh, be um, discussing uh, these uh, three questions in, in the context, uh, in general, of extreme environments. So um, extreme environments are all those environments characterized by extreme conditions, uh, which uh, make it difficult uh, for humans to uh, work and be present uh, in them. So offshore energy is clearly one of them, but also we have, for example, uh, nuclear plants, uh, also extreme, um, extreme environments, um, also mines, underwater operations, and so on and so forth. So in all these uh, cases, um, the human and the robot don't share this, the, the same physical space. And this is the actual point of using robot, that uh, we want uh, to shield uh, the human operators uh, from dangerous conditions. And so we want to send uh, the robot uh, into the extreme environment and uh, the human operator will monitor, um, will monitor the mission at a distance. Uh, now, this physical separation uh, often translates um, in the, um, uh, communication delays between uh, the robot and the human operators, which means that um, the, the robot cannot be teleoperated, but they need to be uh, autonomous in order to perform tasks in the extreme environment. And finally, um, because um, we have usually a, a team of robots performing tasks in the extreme environment, we say that the robots are the actors because they are those systems that are actually performing actions in the extreme environment, while the human uh, might be monitoring uh, several uh, robots at the same time and um, does not necessarily need to intervene if everything goes well. And so we say uh, in this space of shared autonomy that the human is the observer server. Now, uh, these uh, characteristics uh, give rise to a number of uh, challenges uh, for um, realizing autonomy for extreme environments. So first of all, uh, these uh, um, robots in extreme environments need to exhibit a high level of autonomy. And this is because uh, there are not uh, human uh, operators present uh, in the space uh, to be helping the robot if something goes wrong. So they need to be able to handle the situation by themselves. Uh, also, clearly, extreme environments are critical environments in which any mistake be uh, fatal. So robustness of operation is really key in these uh, environments. And uh, linked to this uh, is the necessity to have uh, robots that exhibit a correct and safe behavior, uh, because clearly in extreme environments, uh, we have a strict um, security uh, um, uh, rules in place that needs to be um, uh, needs to be satisfied not only by the human operators of course but also by uh, the robots when they are those uh, to go uh, to the extreme environments and then uh, also usually uh, we see that in extreme environments, uh, we need to perform a variety of tasks, uh, which means that those robots need to uh, exhibit a very flexible behavior. So they need to be, ha be handling uh, a lot of different uh, um, jobs. And also uh, they will have to uh, deal with uncertainty because uh, in, in these environments, uh, there are a lot of um, changing conditions. So uh, in offshore energy, for example, clearly we have uh, the weather changes uh, changing um, uh, all the time. So these uh, robots need to be able to handle uh, uncertainty. And finally, uh, as we said that um, uh, 
uh, those uh, robots uh, forms uh, teams with the human operators that are uh, remotely uh, monitoring them. And because these are, as I said, critical uh, environments, we need um, the, the human operator uh, to fully understand what uh, the robot is doing and also to um, agree uh, with, the, um, uh, with the robot behavior. So we need to create a trustworthy partnership between uh, the, the human and the robots that are involved uh, in the mission. So um, how um, uh, did we uh, go uh, to tackle these uh, challenges uh, in, uh, in MIMRI? Uh, well, um, I have been using um, uh, techniques um, that are in the area of uh, so-called AI uh, planning. Uh, so uh, these um, techniques uh, answer the question, how should I act uh, for a robot? And um, so we use AI planning when we have uh, complex tasks that require deliberation. So when we want our robot to um, exhibit um, a sophisticated behavior that cannot be achieved by a pure uh, reaction uh, to conditions in the environment. So when uh, there are uh, some high level goals that need to be um, achieved and those require uh, careful planning of the actions that needs to be done. So the planner uh, selects and organizes actions to bring about a desired uh, goal. And how does it do that? Uh, it uses uh, causal models um, to predict how uh, the um, robot's actions uh, will affect the environments once they are uh, performed. And in MIMRI, I have been um, using a variety of uh, planning techniques uh, from mission planning from uh, for the entire mission and then task planning uh, for uh, the single uh, robots and then motion planning to actually perform uh, the, uh, the actions. And uh, I will uh, be explaining a bit of that um, uh, in uh, the, um, the next slides. So uh, before that, um, although Amish has already uh, discussed the mission, I just want to recap a bit what we are trying to do uh, here. Uh, so um, hopefully you can see this video. Uh, so uh, again, uh, as Hamish said, uh, we have um, a control system uh, that uh, is going to um, create uh, mission plans. And uh, once the plan is ready, this uh, autonomous vessel uh, is transporting all the robotic assets uh, close to uh, the wind turbine that is uh, uh, already um, moving and it will keep moving uh, in the beginning, right? Uh, now, at this point, we have that um, uh, the drones will uh, inspect um, and map uh, the surface of the uh, blades and also we have uh, um uh, and, and so we have a set of uh, drones to do that. Um, and uh, if um, it is, uh, um, if we discover that uh, the blade needs some repairing, then at that point uh, we uh, can deploy, I mean, the, the drone can deploy um, a, a maintenance robot. Um, uh, the blade bug uh, robot in order to uh, fix uh, uh, any problem uh, in uh, on the turbine and then uh, the autonomous vessel uh, can uh, can go um, back uh, to shore after performing uh, all those uh, actions now uh, clearly as you can see here we have uh, several uh, elements involved in any uh, mission uh, as we said uh, we have this onshore ai based control uh, center which is based on this AI planning technology that I, I was just mentioning. Then we have an autonomous surface vessel. Uh, then we have um, drones, uh, man harrier vehicles. And then uh, we have the maintenance uh, robot. And also, uh, as you will see in the further presentations uh, during this uh, um, uh, this event, uh, you will see that uh, we also use uh, a multifunctional arm uh, with electronic things to perform um, repair uh, tasks on, on the blade. And then we have uh, mechanisms to uh, deploy and retrieve uh, the blade bug or the maintenance robot from, from the blade. So um, basically, this is a quite a complex uh, um, multi-agent system, right? And uh, so... Um, 
uh, in, in, in MIMRI, uh, constructing a complete mission plan requires addressing multiple issues, clearly coordination, cooperation and communications between the different robotic assets, uh, also uh, task and part planning and replanning for each of these uh, robots. Uh, this uh, in turn require domain representation and refinement to be, to be able to enable uh, the, the planning techniques to work. And finally, we have a human machine interface that will allow the human operators uh, to uh, actually interact uh, with these systems. Uh, I have also put in these slides a couple of papers that we have published uh, on this uh, multi agent um, autonomous systems for. Um, memory, so in just in case you need more information about that. Now, uh, let's see how we uh, actually uh, managed to uh, implement uh, these uh, um, um, cooperations and uh, um, coordinations between multiple robots. So, so you can see here at the center in green, we have the global mission uh, planning. And uh, then these uh, uh, interfaces uh, with the different assets, in this case, you can see uh, the drones at the bottom and the the maintenance robot at the top. And also we have this uh, global control uh, center uh, in through which the human operator uh, will interact with the memory system. And this uh, um, is going to be, um, uh, this is uh, on the uh, left hand side. Now, um, uh, as you can see uh, here in, uh, in, uh, in the Global Mission Planner uh, box, uh, we use uh, um, technology based on PDDL. PDDL is a um, language for planning. Uh, in fact, it stands for Planning Domain Definition Language. And uh, in this case, what you do, uh, you have two uh, important pieces of information. One uh, is the domain. The domain uh, is a representation of the world uh, in which the robots um, uh, act and also uh, of uh, the actions that those robots can uh, perform uh, in order to um uh, in order actually to do to to do tasks uh, in the environment, so you can see here um, uh, on the left hand side, I put uh, some fragments of this uh, uh, domain uh, that is specifying this PDDL language, and you can see we have uh, quite a sophisticated domains in which we have to use durative actions, continuous effect, and all the most sophisticated features of PDDL. If if you are familiar uh, with that, you you see that this is a quite complex uh, domain. And you, we have a durative action corresponding, for example, to the UAV takeoff, to the UAV going from one point to another point, and so on and so forth. So we describe all the actions that are available to the robots to actually perform the jobs. And then uh, also we have... Um, uh, the other piece of information that we need for planning, uh, it is a, a definition of a specific problem because clearly the domain uh, in general describes the world uh, that the robots are inhabiting and also the actions, but then we also need to describe a specific mission. In that particular mission, what we want to achieve, so which are our high level goals and also which are the initial conditions that you can see here uh, on, on uh, the right. Uh, now. Uh, also, uh, it is uh, worth mentioning uh, that um, uh, the underlying uh, system that we are using um, is ROS. So our uh, global mission planning um, builds on ROS to then communicate uh, commands to all the different uh, robotic uh, assets. Now, uh, an important uh, part and actually innovative part uh, here of our work uh, is that um, uh, usually uh, the initial uh, state and uh, goal uh, states are uh, um, some sort of um, fixed um, um, specification. While in our case, we uh, decided to uh, create um, what we called a problem uh, generator, uh, because what um, we notice is that um, um, if um, there are uh, initial um, inaccuracies in how we uh, specify uh, the mission, uh, then uh, clearly uh, what happens is that the plan uh, cannot be uh, fully um, uh, implemented and executed by the different robotic assets, and this uh, clearly will uh, trigger replanning in our system, uh, which brings uh, delays in the overall missions. So we, what, what we have tried to do uh, is to minimize uh, the discrepancies uh, between um, 
and the, uh, the model, uh, what we have uh, described as the actions that are available to, um, to the robots with what happens uh, in practice. And in particular, we have also um, uh, created uh, uh, this um, uh, module of um, which we call model learner. Uh, basically, what we are trying to do, uh, we try to uh, estimate and refine the action par parameters, for example, uh, the dynamics of the action du duration and fuel, uh, fuel rate consumptions by introducing uh, simple fuel rate consumptions and then try to we try to modify this model to make it more accurate during uh, the missions by uh, learning uh, if anything goes wrong in any mission we try to learn from these initial mistakes so that the more we use our model and our system the more our system becomes accurate and we don't need uh, to replan anymore and in fact on the right hand side you see here some um, graphs that shows how by using our uh, adaptive problem generator, which uh, tries to minimize the discrepancies between the model and what's going on in practice, uh, we managed to actually uh, reduce replanning quite a lot and to have a model that becomes more and more refined and precise uh, while the um, and the mission goes on. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, uh, all this, uh, so um, this is how our plan will look like in the end. So uh, in the, at the center, you see that we have basically uh, sequences of actions for each robotic asset with uh, an expected uh, start time. And uh, these uh, actions will uh, specify all the tasks that the different robots need to do, the different trajectories they need to follow. And then what happens is that that those uh, actions that are, as you can see, are level actions are uh, translated into actual commands for uh, the robotic assets uh, through uh, ROS. And um, so, um, this uh, also, uh, as I said, another important part uh, of uh, our system uh, is the possibility to interact uh, with the human operator, uh, which is uh, um, monitoring uh, the missions at a distance. And so we uh, work together with Thales in order to integrate our uh, global mission planner um, with uh, their uh, tools in order to uh, create uh, a comprehensive uh, human machine interaction uh, system uh, and uh, my uh, colleagues from Thales will uh, discuss this uh, um, more in depth later. Uh, in any case, uh, we have uh, a number of different views, as you can see in these uh, pictures. So we have a digital twin, uh, we have um, um, a tools through which um, the user can specify goals. Uh, and so um, the user does not need to be, uh, you know, a, a, an expert in PDDL or any planning language uh, or planning at all, uh, it will have just to specify high level goals and then the robotic assets will go uh, and try to uh, achieve those goals as, um, as efficiently as uh, possible. Uh, okay, so um, and this uh, concludes here my uh, presentation. I uh, just want to um, thank the rest of the team, um, our uh, funding um, agency, and also um, as part of my team at Royal Holloway, uh, my uh, research associate, uh, um, uh, Ferdi uh, Jovan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. That was fascinating. Um, and now we're going to move on to the Talis UK team who provided the autonomous vessel to the project and also developed the moving blade inspection system. So Barry Connor, who is the technology and innovation manager at Talos UK, will explain the inspection system and he's joined by his colleague Andy Cooper to introduce the vessel. Um, so just before I hand over to Andy, a brief uh, Andy and Barry, a brief reminder to keep those questions coming in the Q&A function. Um, so Barry, over to you, please. Hi Alex, just check the tech. Can you see my video and can you see the slides? Yeah, all good. Um, yeah. Okay. okay, just give me a second. Uh, okay, okay. Um, good morning. My name is Barry Connor. Um, along with my colleague Andy Cooper, we'll, we'll give an overview of Talis' involvement uh, in the memory project, specifically the Talis Autonomous Vessel, uh, along with uh, the novel Moving Blade uh, Scanner. Um, I've been involved in memory since the Innovation Lab in, uh, in Newcastle about three years ago, 
right from the beginning. So it's been really good to see it, see it evolving. Um, uh, I've been involved uh, um, in stabilization within within Rintala, so so I've, I've very much enjoyed uh, the project. So um, I will try and advance this. So uh, so the outline uh, is as follows. Um, I'll give a brief sort of um, context behind Talos' contribution to, to memory. Um, Andy will talk a bit in, a, in a few minutes about the autonomous vessel, and then he'll jump back to me and I'll talk about recent trials results um, using uh, the catapults um, uh, uh, wind turbine facility at, at Levermouth. So this image shows the two main focus focuses of, of the talk, the autonomous surface vessel, that's operation, uh, and also the, the scanning camera. Okay. Just move. Um, the reason why TALS got involved in, uh, in this project in the first place is because we have vast experience uh, in developing systems uh, that work uh, across many demanding markets, from defence security to, to aerospace, space and ground transportation. So these are all harsh environments, require uh, processing lots of data, require lots of cameras, and also um, require, require systems to be robust in, in harsh environments. So we've also utilised our um, uh, wealth of experience, autonomy, sensing and uh, stabilisation to, to contribute to, to, to the exploitation route of, of, of memory. Um, right, so the context of memory, uh, Sarah and, ha and Hamish already sort of um, described it, but I think it's worth uh, illustrating again and to, to identify uh, the focus uh, from TALUS. So this is an illustration of the memory concept. The first st stage is for uh, the mission planning to, to instruct um, the autonomous surface vessel, which will have the uh, moving blade wind turbine scanner on board to, to inspect uh, the wind farm while it's operational for any defects. Once any defects are uh, determined, um, a decision is made, not necessarily right away, potentially later on, decision is made, there's defects there of interest, then uh, instruct the, um, the next stage of um, um, next stage, which will involve shutting down the wind turbine. Uh, the, the ASV will then carry um, drones and, and uh, robotic systems for more local specific um, uh, inspection and, and repair. So, so the TALUS um, uh, contribution was the autonomous surface vessel and also the um, moving blade camera system. Uh, as Hamish touched on before, up until now, uh, the um, methods are typically uh, rope access and uh, uh, dro drones, but in all those cases, the turbines are shut down. That's costly. It uh, reduces um, 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 electricity production. So what the novel aspect of, of this uh, system is that um, defects uh, can be turbines can be inspected for defects uh, without switching uh, the wind turbine off, and that's crucial. Okay, um, I will touch on that later on. Um, but what the system is on on board an autonomous vessel, which is quite key and important to this project. And at this point, I'll hand you over to to my my colleague Andy. Over to you, Andy. Hi there. Hopefully, I'm visible and audible. Certainly, I'm visible and audible. Okay, I'll continue. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm Andy Cooper. I'm a product manager at TALUS, and I've been involved with the establishment of the Maritime Autonomy Centre at Turnchopper Wharf in Plymouth. It's also home to Halcyon, uh, one of our uncrewed surface vessels, or USVs for short. Um, so TALUS offered Halcyon and the use of the Autonomy Centre to Mimri so that the other consortium members could take advantage of the really great trials facilities we have there and get easy, air, easy access to an area called the Smart Sound, where it's possible to test autonomous vessels and related equipment. There's a range of environments that you can experiment in from shallow to deep and from sheltered to exposed without fear of collision. There'll also be a 5G network covering the sound soon too. Talus occupies several buildings at Turnchapel Wharf, including a couple of warehouses one of which is prioritised for use by visitors. It's the warehouse just to the right of centre in this picture. It makes a suitable place to set up, check kit, 
and run briefings. Next slide, please, Barry. And the housing is an, an 11 and a half meter USV. It's fitted with a full navigation suite and it's certified to Lloyd's and MCA rules as category two, meaning it can operate up to 60 miles from a safe haven. Talus built Halcyon as a prototype for the Anglo-French autonomous sea mine hunting system called MMCM, which is short for Maritime Mine Countermeasures. Like MIMRI, MMCM is built on the concept of an autonomous surface vessel deploying sensors and robots to perform potentially dangerous tasks. Halcyon is still used to prove equipment fits for MMCM today, as well as various other research projects, including the development of new autonomous navigation algorithms. Halcyon is capable of being operated in manned or remote mode and can autonomously follow a mission plan. Talus continues to develop autonomous navigation, sensing and avoidance capabilities through its latest generation USVs being delivered now to UK and French navies. As well as live trials, Talus demonstrated synthetic testing in memory through the use of an environmental digital twin, which Sarah mentioned er earlier. Um, I'll come back to that in more detail later. Uh, next slide, please, Barry. The three by three and a half meter aft deck um, that's in this picture has many uses and has come into its own as a UAV takeoff and landing pad. And that's the role Halcyon took during the University of Bristol trials. The trials began in relatively calm water close to the autonomy center, first with the USV stationary, and then with the USV moving forward at a few knots. As trials progressed and confidence gained, we could venture further out into the sound. It's still normal to have close monitoring and control of USVs while trust in autonomy is being built and regulations are being developed. In our case, Halcyon has a cab, which means a skipper can be on board and in control of the vessel during trials. The Talus trials team based at Turnchapel Wharf um, were prepared trials, plans and risk assessments and secured all necessary permissions to conduct the trials. The trials themselves went well with Talus' support and our colleagues at University of Bristol uh, will give more detail later. Next slide, please, Barry. If you can press play. So now I'd like to show a couple of videos of our digital twin. Hopefully it's running smoothly for you. If not, don't worry, I'll, uh, I'll describe what's going on anyway. Within the MIMRI project, we utilize an environmental digital twin to demonstrate how you can represent the live environment with live data feeds coming in from the sound mixed with a virtual wind farm and USV. That gave us a live virtual environment in which it's possible to run scenarios and assess how the systems respond to the real world. Next slide, please, Barry. Can you do the next slide, please, Barry? Sorry. Okay. And um, oh, back one and press play, please. Okay. So here you can see a mission plan being executed in faster than real time, giving the obvious benefit of being able to run multiple scenarios much quicker than you could do with physical equipment. Within this digital twin demo, you'll see the digital environment in the top left mirrors the weather and the sea state pictured in a live camera feed of the sound that's in the top right hand corner. Live vessel traffic data is inputted from an AIS stream. Next, we'll try to look for some of the vessels operating within the mission area. There is a boat and we'll try to pick it out. We can identify it through the web traffic portal in the bottom right hand corner. It's correctly represented in the twin as a yacht. So job done there. We'll now try following the memory USV through Plymouth Sound and we can follow it out to the imaginary wind farm. USVs are already becoming a safe and efficient method to take sensors like Talis's optronics kit, 
and other autonomous vehicles far offshore where they can then be deployed, like we're already doing or starting to do for the Royal Navy through MMCM, with humans monitoring operations from the comfort and safety of land-based control centers. So you can see here the USV transiting out following the mission plan. When the USV arrives at the wind farm, you'll see on the front of the vessel, the TALUS inspection camera. And there it is. I'll be happy to answer questions as best as I can in the Q&A session, although I'm not particularly technical and won't be able to give details about our work on other projects. But it would be really great to hear from any companies that are interested in using the Maritime Autonomy Centre or our USV. I'll hand back to Barry now, who will be able to describe the inspection camera in detail. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Andy. Okay, um, as uh, Andy has said, the, um, the ASV um, will uh, host the um, novel moving wind turbine blade inspection system. The aim is to provide a standoff inspection capability without the need for shutting down uh, wind turbines and hence prevents power generation losses. As I mentioned earlier, typical methods uh, require um, that uh, it, it shut down. So the way, way the system works, um, it, it, the, uh, it works with the mission planning, it works in sort of close loop with the ASV to, to, to position the camera and position the ASV in the right position uh, in the scan. Um, the, the, the scanners, an automatic scanning is, is um, executed. Um, it captures um, uh, high quality images of all the blades um, uh, automatically um, and it uh, sizes and locates um, defects or, or anomalies in areas of interest. Um, the turbine will still be um, rotating and it will not interfere with the, the operation of, of the wind farm. So the, these are images from taken from a recent trial um, at uh, the Catapults Levermouth facility. Um, and in this particular trial, um, the camera was actually static on the roof of a Land Rover, but the wind turbine was, was, was moving um, at its full rotational uh, rated speed. Um, so, so that's a, a picture of the system. Uh, and the next couple of slides, I will show you an example of some of the um, images and also some of the, um, the defects and, and anomalies we've found on, on the image. So this uh, sample imagery illustrates types of um, the scans from in the cell right across uh, to, the, to the tip. It grabs various images uh, and interrogates, software interrogates a bit choppy, but it interrogates the uh, blades for any possible um, areas of interest um, um, using uh, AI and uh, 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 machine learning type methods. Um, and then once defects are, are, are sized and located, um, then uh, the, the next part of the mission can, can take forward. So that's just showing you it's going from the cell to, to, the, to the tip of the blades. Again, these blades are, are, are always spinning. Uh, so the next slide show you, uh, shows you an example of the detail. Um, here, this is an image captured of the tip. This is the fastest part of the blade with a tangential speed of about 85 metres per second. The damage is, is leading edge protection tape. Uh, and on the right hand side is, uh, is some outputs of the traditional rope access. We can see the, uh, some of the photos um, and, and information taken from rope access course uh, it's stash, stationary here. Uh, uh, the, um, TALUS camera scanner system has estimated that uh, the um, anomalies on these blades are about eight centimetres and about eight, 83 metres for, from the root. That's very comparable with um, the rope access. The next slide um, was actually a challenge set to us by the catapult to try and locate and size several control points. Here is an image captured by the scanner showing that the lightning arrestor and the system uh, detected it at about 71 metres from the root, um, and it's about 64 centimetres long. These are comparable um, estimates to, to, to the rope access. Again, uh, a standoff distance of about 100 metres away 
um, uh, while the turbine is spinning at full rate of speed. Uh, the next uh, image shows, um, again, we didn't know, we weren't given any prior information. So the camera uh, did auto scan. We, we, had, we looked through the image, imagery, captured some anomalies, sized them, located them, and uh, cross-referenced it with uh, the rope access report. In this case, we were able to detect incomplete repair um, of, of size of, of approximately 14 centimetres. Um, again, uh, the turbine was, was rotating at 10 uh, RPM. Um, we also found a very small dot, an anomaly, um, and we were able to size that, we were able to locate it, again, cross-referencing that with the uh, rope access um, we, we um, uh, determined that it, uh, it's a possible lightning strike, and that's of the order of one centimetre. So it's very, very small. So, so that was, in a nutshell, um, summarised very briefly our contribution uh, with the memory. Camera system, of, uh, of course, uh, can be integrated with the bigger picture with the memory, but it also has um, possibilities as a standalone system. Um, on onshore as well as well as offshore. So, so that's something that we, we would like to, to explore. I'm happy to, to receive any feedback at, at the, at the Q&A or please feel free to contact me or, or, or my colleague Andy uh, in these email addresses. So thank you for listening uh, um, and I'll talk to you later. Thank you very, uh, thank you both very much, Andy and Barry. That was a, a fascinating insight. And uh, just to echo Barry's reminder there, please do get your uh, questions for any of our presenters into the Q&A in the chat box, please. And so now it's time to move on to another key component of the system, the aerial robotics. Joining us are three world leading experts in this field. Uh, Dr. Tom Richardson, Senior Lecturer in Flight Mechanics at the University of Bristol. Kevin Lind, co-founder of uh, Perceptual Robotics. And Dr. Simon Watson, Senior Lecturer in Robotics at the University of Manchester. So Tom, I believe you're going to kick us off uh, for this session, so over to you. Brilliant, thank you very much, Alex. Um, okay, I'm actually gonna ask Kevin to share his slides because we're going with Kevin's slides. Oops, yeah. Let me know if that's coming through okay. Yep, that's brilliant. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. I'm gonna be introducing the section where we talk about the autonomous um, uh, deployment and retrieval system. So we've heard about the planning, we've heard about the initial inspection from Talis, and now we're talking about taking the robotic crawler from the back of the vessel, the autonomous vessel, and taking it back up onto the blade, deploying it there, and then retrieving it there. So we had a lot of input from a right, right the way across the memory group, but the four key players in this part of the project were University of Bristol, Royal Holloway University of London, uh, University of Manchester, and, and Perceptual Robotics. Uh, so next slide, Kevin. So it's been quite a difficult 18 months over which to, to carry out uh, practical tests, um, but this will give you an idea of, of some of the test sites that we've been using. Um, so there were, there were key elements we were testing. One was the uh, deployment from and retrieval to the back of the autonomous TALIS uh, vessel. Um, the next one is the approach to the blade and determining where you are uh, locally relative to the blade and where you're going to actually place the crawler. And then uh, the last one is the retrieval of that crawler um, once it's done its job on board. So the map on the left hand side, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank Talis at Turnchapel Wharf and the offshore catapults in, in Blythe, uh, who were fantastic to work with. Um, and we're going to hear today, um, first of all, from Kevin, he's going to talk about the deployment and retrieval to the the um, autonomous boat. Then I'm going to talk about the localization, and then Simon is going to talk about uh, the mechanics, deployment, and retrieval of the um, crawler. So I'd like to hand over now to, to Kevin Lind from Perceptor Robotics, who will talk about the trials that we undertook down at Turnchapel Wharf. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, so the, as you mentioned, um, so I'm Kevin for CTO at Perceptor Robotics. So. I'll be talking about the UAV deployment, sort of specifically the, the takeoff and landing capability. Um, our targets for this were sort of repeatable deployment and recovery to a vessel offshore within a one square meter area. Uh, an integration with the UOB flight systems, Minion and Goliath, names you'll see both in my presentation and then referenced again um, later um, with the other trials. And then um, 
capable of sort of control handovers for various mission planners. And then obviously all of this demonstrated off the Halcyon vessel that you've seen some pictures of. So um, we were doing some offshore dynamic testing uh, across three different days, carried about uh, 18 autonomous landings, seven on Goliath, 11 on the Minion, which is a smaller vehicle in a range of conditions, um, sort of sea state one to two during the, the excellent test days, but um, vessel speeds of up to about 12 knots. So um, I'll show a video first off. Um, this is the Minion system landing at sea, sort of at about a five, five meters a second um, motion of the boat, uh, 10 to 12 knots. Um, this is sort of fully autonomous, where, whereby sort of a, a takeoff command is sent to the vehicle. It will uh, autonomously go, go up and out to a standoff position uh, relative to the boat of about 10 meters up and 10 meters behind, and then hold that position for um, a set time. We've demonstrated sort of a control handover at that stage whereby another mission planner can sort of uh, go about go about sort of deployment of the blade crawler as we mentioned, but for these tests, um, we transition directly into uh, sort of uh, recovery um, to the vessel where it'll fo simply follow back to and uh, land on the on the platform again. So. Um, as I mentioned, this was done with with the two different systems and uh, sort of fully autonomously across the across the two day uh, the three days. Um, the all of the data from this was sort of nicely captured, and we can sort of take a look at some plots. Um, this is the sort of baseline. Um, effectively, the performance of the system is shown here, where um, as in the video, the blue graph is showing effectively what you saw from the side, sort of going straight up to about four meters and then back and away to uh, behind the vessel. And the graph on the right is showing sort of head on looking back down the ship. So you're seeing sort of left and right translation. So this is uh, the, small the small vehicle in static. So these are sort of ideal conditions. Um, when we start moving the vessel, we start getting a little bit more noise and we, we translate around. Um, so this is the, the vessel about five meters a second and uh, several several um, takeoff and landings in, superimposed upon each other. Um, I wanted to note the abort procedure. So you see the one line that's sort of significantly different. Um, as the system is coming in, the last half meter, it's assessing whether it's going to touch down within its estimated um, bounds. If it feels that it won't be, it's sort of unsafe to, to complete. It'll abort up to 10 meters and attempt again. So we see that there with uh, with one of the one of the um, attempts. But in general, this is sort of what we're seeing on the, the small system retrofit with the perceptual robotics uh, landing controller. Um, I will, but we can take a look now at the, uh, the Goliath, the larger system um, from a couple different perspectives. Um, so similarly, this, this should do precisely the same, the same mission. Um, it's worth mentioning a, a little bit about sort of how this the sort of hardware interactions effectively this was um, an add-on to to the system because this this had to have uh, capabilities both for the deployment of uh, the UAV from the vessel but also deployment of the blade crawler from the UAV and so um, the, the sort of modular hardware had to sort of be bolted on to both Goliath and the Minion so the the underlying um, hardware and bits that are that are running this landing controller are, are sort of uh, the same between the two flight systems um, and showing the same the same sort of performance. Um, excellent. So we can we can see some uh, performance of that one as well. Um, very similar looking graph, maybe even a little bit better performed, but well within our sort of um, um, one meter square area designated by the dotted lines. So um, those were the trials that we were uh, carrying out, um, sort of fully autonomous takeoff and landing across the two days in um, sea states of one to two. Um, the vessel got up to about five meters a second, um, but we found that about three meters was sort of the, the, happy, the happy medium. Um, there was a handover demo between a, a UOB mission planner and the uh, and the takeoff and landing controller. Um, 
you can see a picture of the module retrofit to both systems on the on the right. Um, from our perspective, sort of next steps are looking at commercial trials for for manned vessels, um, sort of deploying with the UAV with the assist of this takeoff and landing capability, um, with the idea of trialing it in larger sea states where um, the sea is a little less kind. Um, and then also additionally increasing integrations with autonomous surface vessels such that um, you don't need a uh, anyone on the vessel to to sort of interact and the vessel the autonomous vessel knows when the when the system is touched down and obviously uav recharging is another functionality on the on the roadmap necessary for sort of fully autonomous deployment offshore um so that's my my portion for the the Take off and recovery of the of the UAV. With that, um, happy to, to hand over to uh, back to Tom, and um, I believe Simon will be taking over the, the screen share for some different slides. But uh, feel free to contact me around the UAV deployment, and uh, um, I'm excited to have any questions that you have uh, at the end of the at the end of the Q and A session. Brilliant. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Simon, are you able to share your screen? There we go. So um, ju just to actually touch on what Kevin's been talking about, uh, one of the really exciting things about the project for me was not only is a system that we, we finished up with after the trials at Turn Chapel um, really quite robust or very robust, but all of the trials are carried out and were fully automatic. Um, so it's a really, really good demonstration of how we can automate a, a, a system, a part of the system, and then integrate it into the, the planner and, and keep people engaged in the loop in the areas where we need to. So uh, what we got up on the screen at the moment are three of the different drones that we use during different uh, parts of the, the, the project. You see the two smaller ones on the right hand side that we used for pathfinders and the one on the left hand side, which is representative of the size that the final memory um, system would use. So the one on the left hand side um, can carry the, the blade bug, the blade crawler um, up to the, the turbine blade. So if we go on to the next uh, slide, Simon. So the next point, you've taken off from the boat and you fly up to the blade, and the next uh, challenge is to locate yourself relative to the blade. Um, so you need to detect where the blade is and where on the blade you actually want to land the crawler. Um, so GPS can take you up to the location of the, the turbine, but to locate the blade, uh, we put a scanning LIDAR on board the, the, the drones. And this carries out uh, scanning just in, in two dimensions is, is enough. And uh, what we can do is pick up the profile of the blade and you can see a test being carried out at Fenswood Farm on the right hand side there where it's picking up. Uh, we've got a glider wing, which is a, a proxy for the, the wind turbine blade, and it picks up the, the, the wing. It locates um, where the top of the wing is by automatically matching the shape of the blade to, to a known shape. And then it locates the high point on the blade and, and puts that in its local axis so it's relative uh, for the, the drone itself. So next slide. And here you, uh, this transitions quite nicely up to, to Blythe. So we carried out the same tests up in Blythe uh, on a, um, a wind turbine blade that they have located up there. And you can see our trials team there flying the, the drone up close to the blade, locating the high point automatically, and then coming in to land on the high point on the blade once it's automatically been detected. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to, to Simon, who's going to talk about the mechanism design, uh, deployment and recovery of the drone, of the crawler. Thank you, Tom. Um, so the, the aim of this uh, section of the work was, was to deploy the, the blade bug rover onto the, uh, the wind turbine blade. And so we needed a mechanism that could uh, both carry it from the boat to the blade, but also retrieve it. Um, now, uh, the conditions when you're 100 metres uh, up uh, in the middle of the ocean are, are quite windy, so we needed something that uh, was going to be robust, uh, that we could um, uh, pick up quite easily uh, and uh, allow us to use things like the GPS and that LiDAR system to, to locate it. Um, what we ended up doing was developing a two-part process. So we have a, a mechanism that allows the robot to be deployed and a separate mechanism that allows it to be retrieved rather than a, a single unified system. Uh, so this is um, or shows the, the deployment system. Uh, so we used a, a dummy blade bug down at, at Fenswood Farm. Uh, and this is it mounted underneath the, um, the, the Goliath uh, robot. So I'll show a video of it operating. Thank you. 
So here we've got the the, the blade bug uh, analog system underneath our uh, UAV, uh, and it's uh, taking off from the from the ground. Uh, and it, the, at this stage, this is doing the, the blade scanning that Tom has just described. So using the onboard lidar to to identify uh, where the high point is of the wind. And it should be noted that all of this is underpinned by uh, Royal Holloway's uh, mission planner. So this is all automated. This isn't manually flown. Um, so it carefully uh, deploys the, the robot onto the blade wing uh, and then it returns back to uh, back to shore or the boat. Um, due to, to the COVID restrictions, I think has been discussed uh, already, weren't able to do this as a full end-to-end, -end, so deployment to and from the boat. Um, but we tested it both at, at, down at Fenswood and up at the, uh, the Blythe Test Centre as well. Um, so for the retrieval system, uh, we have a, a link, hook, link hook module. Uh, so there's an arm under slung uh, from the, the drone uh, with a little hook that's able to catch um, a wire that is mounted on the, um, on the blade bug. Um, we've got a, a collapsible version of this. So actually the, the arms fold in on itself uh, and then can fold out. So it's not uh, looking like this uh, at all times. And this is similar to some of the remote pickup systems that were used uh, in the 1960s. You may have seen it in uh, various James Bond films where, where planes fly over and, and pick somebody up with a, a parachute or a balloon. Um, similar concept to that. Uh, so if I show a video of uh, this being done down at Fenswood. So here's the system uh, mounted. You can see that the, the link hook arm is uh, sideways, but then it deploys. We've got active damping on that. So there's a pair of servo motors so we can uh, limit the amount of oscillations underneath it. Uh, on the blade bug robot, uh, you've got this tensioning system. So once the arms have unfolded, uh, this rope becomes taut. We've gone for a, a relatively large um, uh, pickup region um, so that we've got that robustness to environmental disturbances. Uh, so the drone, uh, there's a GPS system on this module as well as a GPS on the, uh, the drone so they can co-locate each other. Once it's uh, got to within the, the correct region, it lines itself up and then it slowly moves in uh, to connect with the wire. And you can see it's, it's, there's a little bit of turbulence and wind, so it's, it's snagged the, uh, the wire, picked it up with the, the hook system, and it can now depart uh, safely from the blade. Um, it then lowers the, the robot back to, to shore, uh, and the, you can just see the, the little hook here is uh, opening up, so it drops the um, drops the robot back on the ground, uh, and then this will the, the robot will then move off uh, to go do the the landing uh, process. So the arm uh, reverts back to the horizontal position, so that it's safe to, to be able to land. Uh, and what Bristol have, uh, have had to do is take account for the the, the changing centre of mass. And this added balance, essentially we've got a, a giant pendulum underneath the robot that needs to be uh, dealt with by the con flight control systems. Um, and then in the horizontal uh, position, you, you're shifting the center of mass. So uh, adapting those flight control systems for the dynamic environments. Uh, and then it safely lands back on the ground. There we go. Um, so those tests were done uh, in a field with a, a glider wing. Um, as Tom showed uh, earlier on, uh, we've also undertaken tests at the, uh, the Oric Fly uh, facility. Uh, so this is on uh, one of their full-size wind turbine blades um, that's stationed outside. Uh, so here we've, we've just had a takeoff from the, uh, the drone with the uh, retrieval system in play. So it's now lining up. You can just see down here, this is the, uh, the, the blade bug uh, pickup system um, with the, the line tensioning. Uh, so it's lining itself up. Uh, we had a few issues here because uh, the, this very large building um, doesn't help with the, uh, the GPS signal. Um, so one of the things we found was, was test sites are sometimes uh, more challenging than, than the actual deployment sites. So once it's lined itself up, 
it then moves in uh, for the pickup. So it's snagged it, picked it up, uh, and it will now um, bring that back for the landing and um, place it on the ground. And all of this, again, is, is fully autonomous. So uh, the mission planner that Sarah presented um, is fully integrated with this. Each of those stages is um, being coordinated by that planner. Um, the, the human operator has pressed play uh, and there is no manual control of, of this drone. Uh, the final system we won't be dropping from a foot above the floor. Um, so I'll, I'll skip the rest of this video. It's on YouTube if, if you want to watch it, because this now just flies off uh, and, and lands again. Um, so what we've managed to demonstrate within the memory project is um, the automatic deployment and recovery of, of, a, of the blade bug system, um, both the mechatronic components, the, um, the flight control systems, and integrated with the mission planner. Uh, as Kevin and Tom have uh, shown, we can do the, the launch and recovery uh, from a boat. Uh, we've shown you can do the, uh, the, the blade inspection, robot launch and recovery, recovery on shore. We do need to integrate those into, a, a, into a, an end-to-end -end demonstration at some point in the future. Um, it's applicable to both marine and, and blade trials. Uh, we could combine those two systems, the deployment and the retrieval, into a, a single uh, approach. Um, but actually some of the industrial steer and feedback we've got was having separate systems was, uh, was okay. Um, this can be expanded and extended beyond the offshore. So whilst that is the primary uh, deployment site, uh, we are looking at opportunities in uh, nuclear sector, in emergency services, general inspections, um, the ability to deploy um, other robotic platforms into hard to get areas uh, is, a, is a really good capability that could open up a, a range of different possibilities. So that's the end of, of our presentation. Um, thank you very much to Kevin and to Tom, uh, and also again, highlight Sarah and uh, the team at Oric for facilitating um, the, the, the final trials. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon, and thanks to Tom and Kevin as well. And please do keep your questions coming in the Q&A function, ready for the final discussion. And now onto the last, but certainly not the least um, element of the memory system, the blade crawler. So the blade bug platform was lent to the memory project for experimentation with a, a variety of tools and scenarios. And here to explain the state of the art in this area, we have Chris Chislak, founder of Blade Bug Limited. And then we'll um, then learn more about the memory innovations of a robotic repair arm from Dr. Sina Sarah. Uh, academic le leader at the Royal College of Art Robotics Laboratory, and Wootsano founder Atif Syed, who will explain how Wootskin, the company's groundbreaking electronic skin, works in this context. Um, so first off, over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, yeah, uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for hosting me. Um, so I'm the founder of Bladebug, and we're developing our universal robotic system um, that's been designed to reduce the complexity of um, inspections and repairs or localized inspections and repairs on wind turbine blades. And we were chosen as the, uh, the supplier of, of the robotic crawler uh, for the memory project from the beginning. So we've been involved uh, from the outset. So it's been really interesting to see how this, this um, program has developed and, and has concluded now. So I'll just give a bit of background about um, Blade Bug and what we're doing and, and the robot itself. So um, we've been working since about 2017 on developing our Blade Bug platform. Uh, it's a small uh, and lightweight agile device that's been designed to be able to navigate and, and crawl over all parts of a wind turbine blade. So from the cylindrical root right down to the small aerodynamic uh, profile right down at the tip. Um, probably worth me sharing. I've got some images which might help visualize what we're, we're doing. Sorry about this. But yeah, so um, the, the, the concept of the robot is to keep it small, um, keep it lightweight and, and very adaptable. So the idea is that the robot is a platform um, it, that can be easily uh, adapted from uh, an inspection device to a repair device with different modules that can be bolted on to that robotic platform. And um, just 
get that screen up. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been developed to be able to follow these tasks, and we've been supported uh, throughout this journey since 2017 by the uh, Innovate UK and the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. And that's enabled us to test and verify every stage of development from essentially a single vacuum cup through to the fully working prototype that we have uh, been developing throughout this new project in, in parallel to this project. So um, we've been working uh, very closely um, to uh, the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, understanding the problems that are involved with uh, blade repairs and the issues that are being faced. And we've come up with this concept of a robot with multiple uh, legs, with multiple degrees of freedom that can adapt and conform to all parts of the blades. Um, this has culminated recently in um, this latest version of the robot that you can see in front of us that has a, a cavity within the uh, body of the robot that we can put different tools in. So this enables us to be really, really easily um, swapped from an inspection device through to a repair device by changing the tool sets, uh, which are all modular. So we can have uh, use existing tools that are widely used within the industry at the moment, at the moment or we can have more bespoke tools, um, such as the repair elements uh, designed to fit within the, um, the space that we have allowed. Um, we've uh, recently had some success um, in the Levermouth 7 megawatt demonstrator turbine in Scotland, where we uh, performed the world's first offshore wind turbine blade walk with our robot. And in April, we went back there and we performed a, a lightning protection system check on the blade. So this is showing the versatility of, of the robot. We performed a full 80 meter blade walk there. And it's really interesting to see how this can be, um, you know, combined with the other elements of this memory project to provide a real unique operations and maintenance solutions for the, the growing offshore wind market. That's gonna face challenges with their um, wind farms being placed further from shore uh larger turbines larger blades and the challenges that they're going to have in maintaining these these um, large devices so um i will um hopefully be around for a little bit to take some questions but i'm in the middle of testing at the moment up in, in the uh, offshore renewable energy catapults facilities in live so i might have to duck out fairly soon but um here's a a shot of the robot that's been on the blade um we have a rope access technician next to it just to sort of make sure nothing untoward happens but when we did our lightning protection system check we were able to validate that with the manual reading and get exactly the same results so we're really excited about where this technology can go and we really feel that we've got a really exciting potential with the other elements of this um, memory project to provide a unique solution for offshore wind uh, operations and maintenance tasks so um that's fairly short and sweet from me, but I hope that gives you a, a small insight into the technology that we've been developing with the assistance of Innovate UK and the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. And um, yeah, I look forward to um, hopefully being able to answer some questions later on. So thank you for your time and I'll let you pass on to the uh, other members um, uh, in this uh, presentation. So I think uh, next we've got Dr. Sina Sarah, if you want to share your screen, Sina. Oh, now. So hello everyone, I'm Sina Sarah, Academic Living Robotics at uh, Royal College of Art. So uh, as my colleagues already uh, explained, uh, we are looking at repairing wind turbine blades. And in particular, we are looking at, in fact, uh, repairing a, a specific problem, which is uh, called leading edge erosion. So we learned from manual processes uh, involved in um, uh, wind turbine repair using rope access um, and uh, this is done by cleaning, sanding, uh, filling and forming of uh, blade cracks and damages. As you can see uh, on the panel number two, so the panel number one is showing the blade leading edge problem. So moving forward, this is uh, the, uh, the autonomous defect detection, resurfacing, and a repair assessment system that we've developed at, uh, during the MIMI project. 
So as you can see, uh, in the beginning, uh, it um, the the robot um, and the camera moves like to to, to detect uh, potential damages on the blade. So uh, here we have a um, uh, an orange section on the top, uh, it which is a um, um, mixing. Uh, basically, it's a mixer for a two parts material that is uh, a use for the. Um, um, uh, for uh, for blade repair, and we have a base translation stage that is uh, basically uh, enabling uh, a least movement of the crawler during the um, repair process. Which means that um, for a um, this is basically a translation stage of, of uh, 50 centimeter by 40 centimeter. Uh, this uh, helps us um, to uh, be able to uh, cover. Uh, a length of 50 centimeter of the blade um, uh, without moving the crawler. And uh, I can, I know, leave it with you to watch the movie. Oops. So in the beginning, uh, it uh, it starts after the um, um, with, uh, finding the damages. It starts with sanding. So the sanding tool uh, now finished actually the work, and then the uh, the cleaning tool starts uh, uh, with the start cleaning. So at the same time, the mixing nozzle mm -hmm. on the top uh, starts mixing the material for the next stage. So now the cleaning tool is cleaning um, um, the dust and um, uh, whatever remains from the sanding process uh, from the plate. And the next stage is the work by uh, uh, the uh, for feeling and forming of the blade. So we have built up the uh, an autonomous uh, spatula, which is uh, which is like uh, uh, which can autonomously tune the curvature because, as you know, the curvature of the blade uh, changes as you move alongside the blade, uh, which is around uh, can be around like hundred meter. So the, this uh, this spatula can autonomously adjust the curvature and then. Um, uh, Form the, the the surface of the blade to recover the original shape. So, at, um, what is happening right now is that uh, the mixing uh, part at the top actually that is uh, um, uh, mixing the two parts material. So, once the two part material is ready, it, uh, the material is passed through a pipe to the uh, to the end detector. So what I have to mention is that uh, the end effector we have here is only 170 grams, so it's very lightweight, and this is thanks to um, a remote location of the, uh, the motors. So we have no electric motors at on the detectors, uh, and all the uh, um, uh, force is transmitted via uh, um, um, flexible shaft technologies. So, now uh, the, uh, the uh, material is deposited on the blade surface after, of course, the sanding and cleaning, and the spatula moves to form it um, to, to recover the, uh, the original surface of the blade. So on the uh, panel number three, of course, you can see the, um, uh, the whole process. On the uh, panel number four, you can um, um, uh, you see the um, a close up view of the uh, of the blade. And uh, on the panel number five is basically uh, you can observe the um, um, uh, the, the repair uh, um, uh, which is done on the blade. The blade itself it is shown there. So uh, the challenge for developing a, um, a repair mechanism such as this is um, 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 due to the constraint of the project is the weight uh, initially. So the weight we needed to um, develop a um, robotic repair mechanism that is um, uh, that, that can be carried using drones. So you should fit within the payload of uh, drone, uh, the quadcopter drones. 
and uh, um, um, then so this basically means that uh, the uh, the design of the system should support um, um, making all ND vectors as lightweight as possible. So the other feature of the of the um, uh, system is uh, the, the evaluation of the repair. So in in addition to um, and be able to detect the, repair, the defects on the blade and repair them. We evaluate the repair process at, uh, at the end autonomously. So this is how it happens. So in the beginning, the erosion is detected. And so you have, you have the erosion, we have detection, then we size the erosion, and then we repair it and, and assess the quality of the repair. So um, and this is assessed by the um, contours that we detect. So in the beginning, uh, the, as you can see, there are contours detected. Once the repair is completed, there is no contours uh, to be detected, which means that the repair process is uh, completed. So thank you. This was my presentation. I hand over to Atif, I think. And if there are any questions, um, I'll be available after the active start. Thanks very much, Sina. Atif, are you able to share your screen now? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. I will see the screen to share. Um, okay. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yep, that's coming through. Brilliant, thanks, Alex. All right. Uh, so, um, Umar and I think um, what we would like to, what I like to be focusing on and highlighting is sort of our involvement uh, in the MIMBY project and, and especially what we have been contributing with uh, with respect to the electronic skin. Uh, as a company, we make uh, dexterous robots. Uh, one of the core elements which allows the robots to be dexterous. Uh, is uh, the, the fully compliant and stretchable uh, electronic skin, which can be fitted onto uh, various end effectors. Uh, so in this particular case, we've fitted our, our electronic skin onto um, the hexapod foot or feet, um, which we have initially tested on our, on our uh, homemade um, version of a hexapod robot, which then transferred onto the uh, blade bug. Uh, robot, which uh, you've heard Chris explaining a bit more about it. So, um, right, okay. So uh, the original concept for us was to really mimic um, the human skin features and allowing the human skin features from with respect to force pressure, temperature, humidity, uh, and, and also strokes and, and detection of direction of force. So, so basically, we wanted to give that feedback to a robotic interfactor. Uh, and, and from the perspective of the uh, blade bug type robot, uh, we would like, we wanted the robot to get feedback with the gas of how it's walking, where it's walking, if the surface of the blade is uh, slippery, uh, it doesn't have what kind of temperature it's, it's having on, 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 at contact. What, at what point uh, the blade bug, the way the, way the blade bug works um, is it turns on a vacuum and effectively sucks onto the surface of the blade. So the skin can give feedback to the uh, blade bug essentially when to turn on uh, and when not to turn on. So for instance, you can have, um, it, it could be that once, the, uh, it could be a situation where the blade bug is, is crawling and at one instance, you'll have maybe one or two of these uh, feet will be just at the edge or just out of the, of the edge of the, uh, of the blade bug, uh, of the wind turbine uh, blade's edge. Uh, and at that instance, uh, you, you normally have a fraction of a second really to make a decision, especially if it's, uh, especially if in the weather conditions that you may not have enough time before the, 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 the entire robot is sort of um, swept away um, into the into the middle of North Sea, so that information is quite crucial to get and to know exactly where the blade bug is walking. So if there's any change of pressure or any change of distribution of pressure, then the other feet which are on the surface of the blade can react and effectively counter that action. So that's what uh, uh, we did. 
uh, as part of the project. We also further scaled up and developed our, our, um, um, our, our sensors. So in our um, electronic skin, we uh, integrate uh, billions of uh, nanowires or nanostructures, which give, uh, which give uh, a piezoelectric response. Effectively, each of those uh, section of the nanowires uh, enable the robot or enable the skin uh, to, to give a, a bit of a piezoelectric response and that enables a robot to know the direction of force. So if, for instance, something is slipping out of, uh, well, slipping out of uh, lane uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the electronic skin, then the robot can know that it's slipping or it's sliding uh, or it's moving in a particular direction. So we were able to increase a, a relatively new concept and increase the yield to up to 99%. We scaled up the manufacturing process uh, of these uh, of these sensors, uh, and I integrate and we integrated it onto the uh, onto the. Uh, but we also developed um, a simple GUI, but but really to give a visual feedback and also a way for for, for us to collect data uh, to do back end machine learning modeling. So we used a lot of this data we collected from the uh, from the uh, from this robot walking on a blade in order for us to then predict what kind of uh, parameters we should be looking out for. So, um, so, so we did, um, so it's a part, it's part of it, we were able to um, test, we initially started off with uh, testing on floor, uh, eventually went on to the uh, testing on the, on the blade, uh, uh, onto the wind turbine blade. Uh, but what we managed to find was uh, we were able to sort of detect at what point, how the robot is actually moving on a play, uh, on a surface of the wind turbine blade. So we could detect um, essentially when the robot is rotating clockwise, anti-clockwise, at what point is going forward. We were able to capture those data points and, and then we were able to, in a way, predict what the robot should be doing next. Um, so this was collected by using the data we, we, we captured from the, from the, uh, from this, from the skin. Uh, we will also be able to see uh, essentially when the uh, crawler or the blade bug was either on a flat surface or is it going up or is it, is it coming down. Um, so we were able to do that, which is crucial in enabling the robot to walk with the best chances of, of success and carrying out uh, a repair job. Uh, we also integrated uh, a, a LiDAR camera, um, essentially enabling the robot to know exactly where Defect is on top of a turbine blade, and and then um, and know exactly where that is, and and sort of use a bit of hand-eye coordination to walk towards that um, walk towards that uh, defect, um, and then using the repair modules developed by other consortium members, you can then effectively repair that element. So that was our involvement um, in, uh, in the project and, and what we have uh, achieved. Um, if there are any questions, let, us, let me know now or, uh, uh, or towards the end of the, uh, of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Chris, Sina and Atif. Um, so we're now going to bring everybody back in for our closing discussion. Please continue to send your questions through for the panel. Um, it's, we're very fortunate to have such a high caliber and mix of expertise all in one webinar. So uh, this is a great opportunity to get some really unique insights. So turning to our first um, question from the audience, and I think this one is one for you, Hamish. Um, do you see any crossover between the work being carried out through the memory project on uh, kind of autonomous robotics and potential O and M for floating wind, in particular mooring lines? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've obviously focused on on wind turbine blade um, maintenance challenges and inspection challenges today, but there's a lot of uh, crossover just with the overall concept and ambition for for unmanned operations. Uh, mooring lines, uh, similar kind of challenge, they, they could be very long. Um, I'm not sure the exact um, statistics um, right now, but kilometers have been talked about. Um, and, to, and with further installations, that's a large um, O&M challenge overall. Um, obviously involves subsea robotics, um, and we'd like to negate the use of divers if there's any intervention possible, but this would still 
uh, we could still envisage um, a memory scenario where you have this mothership and you're deploying um, daughter vehicles to inspect um, uh, mooring lines. Um, definitely, I think that's, that's a lot of cross crossover there. Well, that's that's great. Thanks, Amish. And so perhaps one for for Simon, Tom, and Kevin. So feel free to you know jump in whoever wants to take this one. Um, but for drone flights, generally the CAA requires a visual line of sight to be maintained for drone operations, um, or a similar kind of mitigation for for manned flights. H how is this achieved or mitigated with autonomous flights? Um, are you able to jump in on that? I I can, uh, uh, sorry, go on, Kevin. You go. I was just going to say that for the for the trials we demonstrated, all of the flights were visual line of sight. Um, but in terms of operating what's called BVLAS, which is the, the category that the autonomous systems would be having to be operated under sort of offshore, um, that's a safety case to submit to the, the aviation authorities and sort of has to be, be validated. The key concerns are around um, other airspace users and making sure that sort of collisions don't occur and that you have systems in place to allow for um, sort of sharing of airspace. Um, and so that's that's something that the, the mission planning um, definitely adds into and there's there's questions around specific hardware and that sort of thing. Um, so that's a, a key concern. And then the other one is safety of, of people, which obviously as an autonomous system offshore, there's there's um, good ways of sort of mitigating and separating um, people from the operation such that if there is failure, it's, it's not risk of life. So those are the two key things that you would, having, you would be having to prove to the aviation authorities to get um, certification in this sort of operation. Great, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, and so a slightly different question here, and Andy, I think you might have some thoughts on this, but keen to hear from across the panel. Um, so we've got a question from an aspiring robotics engineer and they're fascinated by the robotics used in wind turbine maintenance. Um, and they're, they're asking what kind of advice would you give someone who's trying to get into this field in the future? Hi there, and hi, Adash, who asked the question. Uh, I'm not sure of your stage of career or, or age, but um, certainly uh, being interested in engineering is a, is a great thing. Um, there's a real shortage of, uh, of engineers uh, in the country today. Um, and autonomy and robotics is a, is a clear growth area, so um, it makes sense, and uh, I'm sure you'll have success um, going into this, uh, into this field. Uh, in terms of what you could do next, um, uh, it would be great to um, have contact with some of the universities either on this call. Um, I'd also point you in the direction of the University of Plymouth uh, that has an MSc in, uh, in autonomous systems. Uh, and Talis are supporting that MSc uh, program uh, with placements at our Maritime Autonomy Centre. Um, so you might want to check that out on the web. There's, uh, there's full details. Thanks, Andy. Some, some really sound advice there. I don't know if any of the rest of the panel want to chip in on, on uh, any of their experience. Uh, yes, I just wanted to say that um, in my view, there is a lot of interesting uh, work that needs to be done at the intersection between robotics and AI. And, and so if you have uh, this uh, both set of skills, I, I think you will be doing a, a lot of exciting work uh, uh, in the future. So, because I mean, what we are really interested in are in intelligent uh, robots, right? So I think that uh, if you study uh, these techniques, uh, I mean, software and hardware techniques, then you're, you will be having a, a really strong profile. Anyone else got any thoughts as well? I would second what Sarah said. Yeah, it's, it's multidisciplinary. So there's a, there's mechanical, electrical, software, and and being exposed to all three gives you a very good opportunity to to get um, a career in a chosen field. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a multiple disciplinary role, and, and learning lots of different elements is is really key. No, thanks, Chris. Um, and so from, from one Chris to another, Chris in the audience who's asked quite a detailed question. So I'm just going to pick out one or two elements of it. So um, he's really impressed with the, the kind of proof of concepts that have been done throughout the, the project. Um, and, and I guess, so there's, there's a couple of elements here. Has anybody been looking at what the potential costs of a, of a memory system might be? Hey, Mish, I know you mentioned this at the start. I don't know if um, 
you're able to comment on on whether any work's been done in that area it's definitely something we've looked at in terms of comparison to, to current means um but in terms of an actual uh, quoted cost for a memory system um that's not something i don't think we're able to um quantify um to a suitable level at this point you can see that there's um module aspects of the technologies and robotic vehicles that we've demonstrated today but um some of those may have different um a, different design considerations if we were to look at a full commercial prospect um such as the, the vessel which was um uh, utilized for other means before coming onto the project so uh, i think that's a little bit further away at this point and, and to expand on that slightly, Hamish, um, another element of Chris's question is about the differing maturity levels of elements of the memory system. Are you able to share kind of how developed each kind of main element is at the moment? Uh, yeah, I think that's something we could we could definitely take offline if, that, if that's possible, Chris. Um, we can discuss overall uh, parts of the, the overall puzzle um, of putting together. Um, and hopefully, yeah, we can give it a decent uh, overview of where it things stand at the moment yeah absolutely quite a quite a detailed question that isn't it Hamish so yeah. yeah Chris if you want to get in touch offline that would be fantastic and uh, uh, uh Alex could I come in here and yeah of course Barry. absolutely thanks Barry. just just to add about the the exploitation uh, roadmap so of the the uh, subsystems of the overall system um within the Tintalis the the, the, the uh, camera scanning system uh, is, is something that Talus uh, it's, it's a new market for us um, we're, we're looking to uh, diversify into to the, to this area, and we're actively looking to to to, to ex exploit that. And it's based based on, on on some of our previous kind of core capabilities. So um, it would be really good to talk to some end users, some stakeholders, just to try and kind of um, firm out this uh, exploitation path and to to really understand a bit more about what people need. But uh, um, yeah. Talents are, are committed to look to, to looking to assessing the exploitation options. If that helps you. No, that's great. Thanks, Barry. And, and if I could stay with you for a moment there, we've got another question about the moving blade scanner um, uh, on a more technical level. And uh, so the question is is how you plan to deal with kind of challenges associated with scanning blades, for example, taking into account lighting, surface cleanliness, focal lengths, and things like that. Yes, um, the, the weather environment is, is certainly uh, um, certainly factors, uh, and we have certainly experienced that uh, during during the trial. When we've had sunshine, we've had hailstones, we've had lightning, uh, um, and uh, um, the, the system has to, has to kind of react to that. Um, you're right that the the um, the light the, these these are all all challenges, um, but our, our system is. Uh, designed to try and, try and mitigate that. Um, but there's this combination of, um, um, uh, sort of choosing the cameras to 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 work in different environments. Also, there's image processing. There's adapt adaptive uh, camera controls, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and also um, some sort of anomaly in AI detection, as well as just the camera itself. Another big challenge is is the is is the um, stabilization is the environment uh, in order to get a, a stable camera. So yes, it's no, no doubt that there's, there's challenges there, but I think we're going in the right direction for solving it. Hopefully that answers it, if not happy to take it offline. No, thanks Barry. And I think that range of weather conditions you described there sounds like a fairly standard day here in Glasgow. So, uh, <laughs> um, so moving on to the next question, um, and this is a fairly open one uh, because I suspect that there'll be different answers from across the panel. Um, how long do you see it being before mainly unmanned operations become the normal? Um, so I'll open that to, to anyone across the panel that wants to respond. I'll maybe kick us off. Um, I definitely think this is going to be a staged approach. Um, I think it might be a little bit longer in terms of fully unmanned operations um, or uh, across all different wind farm tasks, but there are definite areas where that's a bit more applicable, a bit more uh, feasible uh, in the shorter term. So I think we a bit of a cop-out answer, but I think we, we should see um, some decent um, uh, examples of um, unmanned operations um, in, in the next, uh, fully unmanned operations in the next five years ago, but there might be aspects of it that take a bit longer um, and further into the future. Mm -hmm. And does, does anybody else from the panel want to come in on that with some different perspectives? Can add a 
uh, the perspective. Um, so I think it might be interesting to understand what the barriers are to, to fully unmanned operations. And I think um, it's uh, areas around trust, reliability and resilience. So uh, if you look at um, robotics in manufacturing, uh, where we have fully automated factories, there's millions of hours of operation. Uh, those robots are very reliable. There's a huge amount of data about their operation. And so we can understand how they're going to operate. Mobile robots are in their infant infancy. Um, they haven't been adopted by any major application area. Logistics is, is arguably one of the areas that's leading the way. Um, but those robots tend to be uh, fixed wheel, four wheeled ground robots trundling around a very defined and, and safe environment. So if you start looking at these complex systems that you want to run autonomously for extended periods of time, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done on that reliability, that resilience, what happens when they break, how do you retrieve them? Because you don't want to have to be sending people out to the wind turbines to go and fix the robots when they may as well have just been doing the, the fixing themselves. So I think there's quite a lot of work to be done on that. You have with the autonomy, trust uh, and, and security. So um, we, we trust humans because we train them. You know, we put them through rigorous training schemes to, before they're allowed to do those remote inspections and, and operations and, and repairs. Um, we have still yet to formalize what we mean by trusting an autonomous robot to do its mission. Uh, and it's interesting that, that we observe robots are often held to a much higher standard than humans. Um, and, and you can look at examples in uh, autonomous cars. You know, if, if we look at that as, as probably the leaders in, in the use of autonomy, um, we're quite happy to put a 17-year-old uh, behind the wheel of a car give them 20 hours worth of instructions and let them loose on the road. Um, that's societally acceptable. Um, but 20 hours of testing with a robot and we won't let it drive around, um, you know, a, a busy street. And so, you know, the, the, there's this tension bit between, um, you know, levels of acceptable trust within society, within the environment and, and what is feasible and, and actually achievable. Uh, and I think the last thing to, to add is just there's some still some technological barriers. And I think power is the biggest one or, or one of the biggest ones. Um, batteries on, on robots that the, the technology still isn't there for extended operation without having to, to recharge. And so um, there's still a lot of development there to, to get drones that can operate for longer than 20 minutes um, for robots that can last for longer than a, than a day. And, and Sarah, I can see you've got your hand up. Do you want to come in as well? Yes, I just wanted to highlight uh, that uh, the techniques that we have, we have been using to underpin autonomy in MIMRI uh, are based on uh, symbolic uh, AI. Or, so this is uh, also called uh, uh, white box AI, right? So these techniques can, uh, you know, the plans that we uh, obtain can be verified and some guarantees can be uh, give, we can give guarantees on on risk, you know, and several other uh, metrics. So I think this is uh, a very important features uh, of memory because uh, clearly this uh, goes into the direction of these systems being trusted because we can guarantee that they will, uh, you know, the, the robots will achieve the goals that we have set uh, for them. No, and Sarah, if I can um, stay with you on a move on to a slightly different topic, um, because of your, you know, your fascinating background working with NASA and, uh, and, and kind of space sector. Um, was there any inspiration from from kind of space ex exploration technologies for the memory system and the memory project? Yes, I mean, I think this um, AI uh, planning uh, techniques that that we use uh, in uh, in memory are uh, they have a lot of um, relationship with the techniques that are used uh, in uh, space mission operations because many of the requirements uh, are similar, right? I mean, as I discussed it during my talk, this uh, need of robustness and also the ability to to verify uh, the system to ensure correctness and, and and safety. Uh, also, this uh, in the importance of uh, the robots being uh, flexible in their behavior, right? Because I mean, we have seen uh, uh, you know machine learning techniques uh, in in within AI uh, really 
uh, reaching a great uh, success, but uh, usually this uh, is in one specific task. While we need these robots to be doing a lot of different things at the same time, and the same is in space, right? You you send a rover on Mars, uh, you want these rovers to be able to do uh, many different things at the same time. So uh, the, the technology that underpins uh, this uh, memory system and um, and the previous uh, missions on Mars uh, is very similar, in fact. Brilliant. And uh, so, Atif, if I could turn to you um, briefly. Um, so I guess making kind of smart robotic feet is a, is a really interesting application of, of your kind of root skin uh, product. Um, is there, what other applications could it be used for? So, uh, I mean, um... For us as a company, we are uh, uh, pretty much on a mission to democratize robots, really getting robots into different aspects of, of, of society. Uh, one of the areas where we are heavily involved, uh, which you can sort of see with the photo behind me, uh, is, is picking fruits um, and veg. So basically, uh, the fact that the skin is able to very sensitively uh, give feedback to an end effector to, to, to handle uh, delicate objects with dexterity. We were able to use that technology in, in a robotic end effector to, uh, to effectively pick and package and prune and, and, uh, and handle fresh produce. So, so as a business, we have, uh, we, we're commercially selling those robotic systems uh, out, out to the market. Um, we do complex uh, fruits uh, from table grapes to a bit easier ones like tomatoes. So, uh, the, the applications are quite uh, quite vast. What we focused on as a business was going going initially towards markets which are immediately ready uh, to integrate robotic systems because the problem was available yesterday. So uh, and then looking at projects like Mimbri and, and and quite a few other projects which we have, uh, which would be uh, which would be realized in the next in the very, very near future. So, so the applications which immediately required attention and immediately we could have, we could uh, enter and we have entered the market and, and sort of capture it as quickly as we can. And then the applications where we can use this uh, a bit in the future. Well, thanks very much, Atif. Um, so back to another question from the audience here. Associated with wind turbine operations. And do you think that that cell saving helps us? Uh, on the panel, have any thoughts on that question? Again, I may, I may kick us off and then see if anyone else wants to, to add anything to my comments or, or correct me um, if they think differently. Um, so yeah, I think we could potentially see because we're, uh, robotics are able to access um, uh, enhanced weather windows, go out to the turbines potentially more frequently than we would see normally with typical um, inspection regimes. We could understand the condition uh, of our asset um, more regularly and then uh, the kind of uncertain risk of those uh, those components failing uh, is, is, less, um, is less uncertain. So we, we could see um, insurance costs failing. Um, whether it will offset the, the risk of um, robotics use, uh, that, that's, I think that's a, a definitely a, a different consideration. Um, and I think Simon um, put it quite eloquently in terms of uh, what level of, of trust is, uh, is required for, for it to be fully accepted in this environment. Uh, it's difficult on what threshold we'll, we'll get to. Certainly uh, extensive testing will be required, but um, uh, what, what level will that be before full commercialization? Absolutely. And, and does anybody else on the panel have any thoughts on, on that particular topic? Okay, um, so looking at the time, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Um, thank you to all of today's panellists. It's been a real privilege for me, certainly. Um, and I'm sure the audience has really enjoyed learning more about the work that's been going on through the memory project and to kind of get a window into such an ambitious project. Um, all those who have registered for the webinar will receive the event recording within the next day or so. And we'll also be posting a recording of the event on our YouTube channels. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and likewise, keep an eye on uh, at ORE Catapult on Twitter and 
uh, offshore renewable energy catapult on LinkedIn for more robotics and other offshore renewables news. Um, so I'm sure that 2021 will absolutely continue to be uh, an offshore wind odyssey, and we look forward to seeing you again very, very soon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Alex. Thank you. <laughs>